It's great to be with you. Uh, you should have a, a handout uh, in front of you. Uh, I can't resist uh, doing a, a handout. Hopefully this will help you as, uh, to make notes. If only people could shed their self-awareness, their individuality, their sense of royalty. If only they could simply dissolve into the world around them like plants and animals do, without norms or morals. But they cannot. They are human. They exist with the indescribable greatness as well as the pathetic woefulness that that term covers. In uh, my uh, three sessions, I really hope to uh, complement uh, what's uh, already been said. And I want to, I suppose, issue a challenge uh, and an encouragement. I think often... Uh, we do have a kind of what you might call a, a, a traction problem. How do we gain traction in the culture to be able to proclaim the glorious gospel to the context that we're in? And uh, the problem with the traction is that I think sometimes the, the wheels are spinning and there's the smell of rubber, but we're not actually moving forward very quickly. And I think especially as reformed believers, there's a particular... Um, uh, construal or a particular equation that I, as I grow older, find difficult to kind of balance. On the one hand, is a certain confessional truth about the truth of the Reformed faith. Sola Scriptura, we, we interpret uh, the world through the word. We have a rich theology, a rich anthropology, a rich Christology, that body of divinity that we, uh, we base our lives on, that, that, that is founded upon scriptural truth. And we confess that. We're confessional Christians. But on the other hand, we struggle a little bit more with issues of context, issues of contingency, the fact that we are created beings in a, in a, a located place. We are finite and therefore, how do we match or how do we contextualize that, that glorious body of divinity into our particular time and place where we are at the moment? And so confession and contingency together, how do we do both well? How do we recognize both well? And that's where I think uh, reformed missiology can help us especially uh, sitting on the shoulders of uh, past uh, uh, greats, I suppose. And so um, the material that I'm going to develop is really uh, sitting on the shoulders of uh, two uh, great reformed missiologists. The first has already been mentioned this morning uh, by James, and he'll be talking more about uh, this, this person in, in the third session. Uh, but uh, J.H. Bavinck, a reformed missiologist who was a uh, um, worked in what was then uh, Java, um, 1895 to 1964, and then ended up teaching in Campen and at the Free University. And also another great uh, reformed missiologist, a little bit more Bartian, so I'd have a few more questions about some of his big uh, commitments, but this guy called Hendrik Kramer, a kind of a polymath who um, bestrode the great missionary uh, conferences at the beginning of the 20th century in Edinburgh and Tamburan. And I think that they produce or they give us what I'm going to call um, a morphology, a, a way of understanding culture that I think you can apply these theological tools to any cultural context because they're rooted in confessional truth. They're rooted in the Reformed faith. And I hope with the eyes to see, given the tools, that then we can take those tools and apply them not simply to the, the context that Kramer was in or J.H. Bavinck was in, but to our context here, our weird and wonderful world that we live in at the moment. What about that weird and wonderful world? Well, uh, on your uh, handout, here are two just cultural artifacts that I observed um, on, in my hours exercise during lockdown one. So um, I currently live in North London, and if you turn left out of Oak Hill College and you walk left, you come to something called the Chicken Shed Theatre Company. Uh, those of you who know Oak Hill will know the Chicken Shed Theatre Company. It's quite a well-known, inclusive theatre uh, uh, company over, over many years. And um, 
uh, they'd, have to, they'd had to pull their advertisements because there were no shows going on. But this is what they wanted to say to the world coming past last year. Ubuntu, translated simply as humanity, or the belief in a universal bond that connects all humanity. Chicken Shed will continue to strive to connect all people and all communities. I am because we are. Continued on my hours exercise. Another 800 metres outside Cockfosters train station. Here is uh, the bus shelter advertisement. Whether you're born here or not, if you know to stand on the right, you are a Londoner. We are not an island. We are home to so much more. HSBC, together we thrive. Now, what I want to uh, argue and take, um, because hold you by the hand through these three sessions, is showing you how they, 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 those artifacts are two preaches to me as I'm going on my walk. And how do we take this vision, these mini sermons, I suppose, about how these people view the world, what they want us to understand, and how do we uh, confront and how do we connect them to the gospel of Christ? to a Christian uh, worldview, to systematic theology, all the things that we love because we know uh, that life is found. How do we connect these things to people meeting Jesus? So this first session is um, a kind of bit of groundwork, a bit of foundation. I hope it complements what uh, our speakers have said uh, this morning. Tomorrow, we're going to look at this particular um, uh, tool or this uh, morphology that J.H. Babbitt calls the magnetic points. So we'll expound those points tomorrow, giving um, uh, some kind of contemporary examples of how I see them uh, in society and as a, as a way of you doing the same work. And then in the third session, we'll be saying, well, how can we take this framework, this anthropology, and apply it in various areas to apologetics, to discipleship, to the study of religion, a more academic subject, and then I want us to look at civility as well. What does it mean to uh, be civil in a society, and how can this help us? How can this have an apologetic import in our current cultural moment? Now, as we look at uh, our context, our Western context especially, uh, as we are in 2021, there's a discussion going on among sociologists of religion as to the kind of state that we are in. And I think it's quite complicated because some of these sociologists who are um, uh, Christians of various hues say, well, not just slightly different things, they can say very different um, types of things. And it's important we kind of understand where they're coming from. Let's start with someone you may have heard of or may not, uh, a philosopher of religion called Charles Taylor, who's written this huge book called uh, A Secular Age. It's been popularized by um, the, the philosopher uh, Jamie Smith in a book called How Not to Be Secular. Um, and Taylor's very interesting. Um, I mean, I have quibbles with it. Um, the Reformation gets a bit of a kick in, which I uh, don't like at all. But his big point is this. When you say to people, what does it mean to live in a secular society? He says, it doesn't simply mean that there were more people going to church 100 years ago and now they're less. It, it, it's more complicated than that because there's still a lot of belief around. He says it's not even the idea that there's a secular realm and there's a kind of a, um, a public faith or a, a, a private realm. You can, it, that secular kind of helps in that way. I mean, secular really just means this worldly. But what Taylor says is that we live in a secular society is not just what people believe. It's about believability. And that's where he says, in a sense, we all live in this secular age. He says, 400 years ago, it was inconceivable that you wouldn't be a Christian. Now, the Christian faith is just one option amongst many. And for that reason, the nature of belief, he says, is quite different Religion, faith, is both contested and contestable in a way that it never was before. So it's the kind of the, the, the way in which we hold beliefs. And you may know that. People in your congregations, 
uh, who become Christians. It's a big thing. And I mean, Taylor has all these kinds of words, some of them a little bit more pretentious than others, but he has this idea of how we've become equals fragilized. Um, it's a bit like, you know, if I said to uh, Levy, um, where's the best uh, Indian restaurant around here? And I Google it, and I'm looking for the five-star restaurants. I know that each one of those five-star restaurants will also have a one-star review. Now, how am I to decide? And that's the sense in which uh, Taylor says we live in a secular age. Now, we could contest that and talk about that, but the thing I want to focus on is this idea that Taylor develops and that he says in the West especially, we have become disenchanted. He says that we've become immune to religious experiences, being only in tune with the worldview of what he calls or uh, what prepares the world for what he calls exclusive humanism. Another term for that might be scientism. This is to say that genuine knowledge of reality must be determined by the hard sciences, physics, chemistry, biology. It's the John Lennon imagined song, um, Above Us Is Only Sky. And so, uh, as a result of that, Taylor says that as cult the culture that we mainly live in here, that we've become disenchanted. Now, I want to contrast that with another historian of religion. Again, some of you may have, have heard of him. A guy called Rodney Stark teaches at Baylor. And he questions this. Listen to Stark. He says, Europe hasn't become disenchanted. Multitudes of Europeans believe in ghosts, lucky charms, occult healers, wizards, fortune tellers, hulder folk, and a huge array of other aspects from that enchanted world that Taylor believes has long since vanished. What Taylor really demonstrates is that from nowhere is one's vision of modern times so distorted as from the confines of the faculty lounge. Meow. So these are kind of academics are kind of having a go at each other. Taylor's saying, no, we're not disenchanted. We're enchanted as human beings as we've ever been. And there's certainly some evidence for that. There's a big uh, multidisciplinary disciplinary study that was finished uh, two years ago, or the interim findings were last year, it might have finished th this year, um, run by the University of Kent, called Understanding Unbelief across disciplines and across cultures. And it looked at uh, qualitative research about unbelief, people who don't believe anything, in Brazil, China, Denmark, Japan, the UK, and the USA. And here's were two of the interim findings. Unbelief in God doesn't necessarily entail unbelief in other supernatural phenomena. Atheists, and less so agnostics, exhibit lower levels of supernatural belief than do the wider populations. However, only minorities of atheists or agnostics in each of our countries appear to be thoroughgoing naturalists. That is, they believe that nature is all that there is. Or another common supposition, that of the purposeless unbeliever, lacking anything to ascribe ultimate meaning to the universe, also does not bear scrutiny. While atheists and agnostics are disproportionately likely to affirm that the universe is ultimately meaningless, in five of our countries it still remains a minority view among unbelievers in all six countries. Now what I'm trying to kind of set up here is that the situation that we live in is complex, and I think there is a sense in which Taylor is right and that Stark is right at the same time. The way that I'm kind of categorizing it is not that we're disenchanted, we're rather differently enchanted than perhaps we were. As uh, Jamie Smith says when he's talking about Taylor, he has this uh, phrase which, which I think is very true about a lot of people, normal people who we engage with, not people like um, Stephen Fry or Christopher Hitchens or Dawkins, but, you know, just the average uh, person around, where he says uh, this phrase, you know, the secular is haunted. The secular is haunted. People find it very difficult to close the door completely, to say above us is only sky. Uh, the, 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 the writer, the novelist Julian Barnes, wrote a, a book a few years ago, atheist writer, called Nothing to be Scared of. And his opening of that book 
really does typify where I think lots of late modern people are. The book starts like this. I don't believe in God, but I miss him. Isn't that a great way of just summarizing? I mean, we heard it this morning with attitudes to death. I don't believe in God, but I miss him. Of course, there's lots of other examples uh, as well. The one that I've been uh, using a lot is uh, a few years ago, Champions League final, um, uh, Tottenham uh, about to play in the Champions League final. Maurizio Pochettino is still the manager. There was a piece done on him. You think of the science, you think of the kind of the business uh, and nous and acumen that goes into running a Premier League club. In his office, Maurizio Pochettino has a bowl of lemons because when people come in, who have negative energy, Pochettino believes that the negative energy goes into the lemons. And so he changes the lemons once every few days to get rid of the negative energy. This is someone who's at the top of running a kind of a a multi-million pound uh, business. I don't believe in God, but I miss him. Just finally, as we look at this sociology, a fascinating thing here. If you think there is a a tension or a... um, a problem or a, 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 a split between what you might call enchantment and disenchantment, between scientism and kind of mystical, magical stuff. Here's what uh, the philosopher Peter Kreef says uh, about this quotation I'm about to read, which he says is the most illuminating three sentences I have ever read about our civilization. It's from C.S. Lewis, The Abolition of Man. Lewis says this, there is something which unites magic and applied science, i.e. technology, while separating both from the wisdom of earlier ages. For the wise men of old, the cardinal problem had been how to conform the soul to reality. And the solution had been knowledge, self-discipline, and virtue. For magic and applied science, like technology, alike, The problem is how to subdue reality to the wishes of men. The solution is a technique. He's saying, whether it's a shaman casting out a demon, or whether it's the latest artificial intelligence, they are united by the same thing. They're trying to subdue reality. And those of you who know anything about intellectual history will know that science and magic have been very closely allied throughout the ages. We think there's a huge gap between them, but actually, historically, they've always been very closely linked. How do we subdue reality rather than how do we just understand reality that is in front of us? Now, for the reformed believer, this analysis, this complexity, should not be a surprise. And it's everything that James was saying this morning. There, there's, a, there's a rich anthropology that kind of says, do you know what, Charles Taylor, I think you're kind of right. And Rodney Stark, I think you're right. So as we come to the biblical text with that kind of framework uh, in mind, let's just, I want to lay now just the foundations of what I'm going to call a, a kind of a reformed theological anthropology which kind of deals with some of these complexities that we've been talking about, gives us traction, but opens our eyes to say, actually, we can understand what's going on here. I think sometimes, we're in, that, in the words of the song, we're just so kind of bewitched, bothered, and bewildered by the world around us, we don't know where to start. But of course, with, with the, the eyes of Scripture to see, we start saying, hey, I, I can actually understand what's going on here. So, knowing, not knowing, Let's call the whole thing religious. I want to imagine, again, a kind of simplistic way of understanding it, but the the relationship between human beings and God is like a a huge cosmic game of hide-and-seek. And in popular opinion, in this cosmic game of hide-and-seek, God is the one who's been hiding, and we've been trying to look for him. And you know what? We've looked everywhere. We've really tried hard. Yuri Gagarin went up to space, came back down, apparently said to the communist authorities, although there's questioning now actually whether he did say this, there's no one up there, I've been up there, there's no one there. We know, don't we, from Romans 1, that God is not hiding. The wrath of God is being
being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse. God is not hiding. His, his, his fingerprints, his DNA are on everything that has been made. Now, two points to note here on a very seminal passage, which you will know. And of course, James was talking about it this, this, this morning. And uh, just some points here. And this is where I want to kick into some of uh, J.H. Bavink's analysis, which I think is pregnant with, for further potential and possibility. The first is that we are made to relate to God, the image of God, of course. Um, our dignity and worth is, not, is uh, given to us in the fact that we are made uh, in the image of God. But what I found interesting, and Babbitt makes little comments about it, is why does Paul choose these two particular invisible qualities in Romans 1? And please, I mean, I'm throwing some stuff out here. Please, answers on a postcard or come and talk to me afterwards if you've got any kind of, not better ideas, but other ideas. Why? Why? Eternal power. Why divine nature? There's all kinds of other ways that Paul could have described the invisible qualities. Why is it those two attributes? Eternal power and divine nature. And I've looked through in the last few months, I've been on study leave, I've looked through loads of commentaries, Romans commentaries, and do you know what? Not a lot of commentators really give a reason. They don't really know why those two things are um, highlighted. J.H. Bavink says, well, how about this? Eternal power is the idea that we are created beings and we are sustained by the eternal power of the creator. That is to say, God is revealing in everything that has been made, including ourselves as God's images, that we are dependent upon God. Dependence is a key kind of um, uh, uh, implication of God revealing his eternal power. Dependence. And divine nature, well, nature gives the, the, the idea that God has a nature, that there is a personal relationship we have with this God, which means that we don't relate to this God as a something or an it, and when we're in a personal relationship with one who is divine and we are created, therefore we are accountable to that being. In other words, accountability becomes the key word. And this is only in one paragraph of Bavink's book, Religious Consciousness. But what's interesting, and again, I'm almost going to leave this comment here because we'll come back to it tomorrow, that this morphology, this idea of the magnetic points, which you have no idea what I'm talking about yet, but you will tomorrow, are all based upon that understanding of dependence and accountability. These magnetic points, these touchstones with which we connect and confront with the gospel, all go back to the idea that as human beings, we are made for dependence and that we are made for accountability to something or someone. Before the fall, it is to God. After the fall, well, it's to all kinds of other things. But dependence and accountability are very important in, in, um, in, in how we understand ourselves and our relationship to everything else. So, eternal power and divine nature. Now, not only are we made to relate to God, we're made to cultivate. And of course, this gets into a conversation about culture. And I suppose, um, just to kind of give a particular application, so I don't kind of... Um, just uh, repeat uh, everything that was said this morning. There's a sense in which we are made to cultivate, we are made to have dominion. And the key point here is the culture that we produce, the way that we make a home for ourselves, the way that we uh, are to fill and sub subdue the earth. It's very important to note that when Christians or any human beings do culture, they're not taking a blank kind of, slate, I suppose, and investing meaning into it, creation already has meaning in it. As Ted Turnow says, when we do culture, we aren't simply making meaning. 
We're responding to meaning that is already there woven into creation. Now, in Romans 1, uh, well, in Romans 1, what directly is being revealed is the wrath of God. The wrath of God is being revealed. Now, the way that I liken that when I did this little book called Plugged In, I talked about it in terms of shadows. That we believe, don't we, there is the wrath to come. But for all kinds of reasons, if you imagine this, uh, um, this, this idea of a, a tarpaulin or a canvas in which God's wrath is being stored up. I mean, that's what we find out in Romans. It's being stored up. People are wandering around thinking everything's okay and the wrath of God is being stored up for the day of wrath. But for all kinds of reasons, to let us know what's going on or the problems that we are facing, that something is not right, it's as if God takes a little pen knife and puts a little slit in the tarpaulin because we experience the wrath of God now in all kinds of different ways. And that's why I call it a shadow. It's kind of hell writ small now. It's the shadow of the wrath to come, the kind of beamed back. And so when we see things like um, death or experience death, it's not as if death is a blank kind of, we can give the meaning it wants. Death already has meaning in it. Just read Psalm 90. Death is saying all kinds of things. Now, what we do in our suppression of truth is we get the big, fat kind of marker pen and we graffiti over our own meanings. We say, well, death isn't all that unnatural. It's just the gentle passing of one thing to another. But in doing that, we are making meaning. We're giving our own meanings to something that already has meaning, the wrath of God. The wrath of God is meant to show us or reveal to us something's not right here. I need to do something about this. We completely turn that on its head. The wrath of God being reveal, revealed becomes for unbelieving people. They say, well, we can't believe in God because these terrible things happen. But the wrath of God is meant to lead us to God in repentance. Similarly, elsewhere, we see what I call sunbeams, heaven writ small, the wonderful nature psalms, the way that God blesses creation and blesses human beings every single day. And we're meant to look up this is a bit like Lewis said, the meditations in the tool shed, isn't it? It's looking up the sunbeam to see the sun. Wow, God's given me these amazing gifts. I want to serve him. Is that how human beings think about the gifts that they've been given? No. These are mine. I don't care. I'm not going to share them with others. So what's meant to be God revealing himself in a sunbeam it is made into something that we become very ungrateful for and we're kind of, uh, in, we become more entrenched in our unbelief and our stubbornness. The fact is, though, that culture always contains meaning already. So, we've got our cosmic game of hide-and-seek. God is not hiding. In the cosmic game of hide-and-seek, we are hiding. Again, don't mean to make this into a kind of a children's talk, but where is the first game of hide-and-seek? In the garden. Adam and Eve hid because they're ashamed. God says, where, where are you? I happen to think that God is omniscient, omnipresent. He knows where they were. But it's a moral judgment. Why are you hiding from me? We know that after the fall, there is a relational breakdown. Yes, we as um, images of God, we, we still have dependence and accountability. But now that is on or in someone else or something else. We, st we still make culture, we still make a world for ourselves, but we've become cultural rebels. And so we have these, uh, these great expressions, suppression of the truth. I think literally that the, the idea originated from the idea of holding someone's head under the water. We, we drown the truth. We drown the, the messages that God has given in creation. Um, Bavink again, and I was talking to... Uh, James about this last night. Bavink is very influenced by kind of the, the, the up and coming uh, discipline of psychology. So there's quite a lot of psychoanalytic talk here about repression. We repress the truth. But because we're made to worship, we can't just suppress the truth. We have to replace the truth with something else, which is the substitution and replacement. And of course, here we come to the idea of idolatry. Now, what's all this got to do with, I suppose, engaging our culture and cultural apologetics? 
Well, God's revelation and our response to God's revelation is why culture is meaningful. Culture is the appropriation of revelation and culture is our godly or godless response to revelation. Are we going to stifle and suppress the, 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 the messages that God has given us or are we going to amplify them? And so there's a constant kind of um, divine human kind of dance going on. God reveals. We suppress. God reveals. Of course, if we was totally suppressed, we would have an excuse that we don't know. But Romans 1 says we do know. And here we have that paradox, I suppose. We know and we don't know at the same time. Again, the, the illustration that I've likened it to, I think I probably have got this off Bill Edgar, but I, I don't know, is this idea of when you go swimming in the sea, you have the beach ball, and the game is to try and sit on the beach ball. You try and sit on the beach ball, and it pops up again. God is constantly, we try and suppress the truth, but it always pops up. We suppress the truth. There's this divine human dance going on all the time. We can never finally extinguish our humanity at that point. Yes, we can bury it, but it's like one of those fake birthday candles. You try and do something to that candle, and it always flicks back. The pilot light's always going to come back on. Thank God for that, or else, we, or else this conference, there's no point in this conference, Dave, basically. What's the point of apologetics if there is no point of contact? But there is always a point of contact. People never lose their uh, dignity or their worth at some level. Yes, we have to excavate. Yes, it's culturally variegated in that God sometimes has let people go and let cultures go to a terrible degree. And yet still, there is always, I think, and it gives us hope, there's always a way in. Are we looking in the right places, though? Now, as an apologetic aside... Uh, I suppose this, for those of you who are interested, you don't have to be apologetics nerds or whatever, it doesn't matter. But for those of you who are, I suppose this is one of the reasons why I would call myself a presuppositional apologist. Um, Bill Edgar, again, uh, still at uh, Westminster, a good friend, he wrote this great article a few years ago called Without Apology, Why I'm a, I Am a Presuppositionalist. And he says, presuppositional apologetics, this idea of worldview, the idea of getting to the heart of things, the things that drive everything else, Presuppositional apologetics, I believe, recognizes the religious core of our natures better than other systems do because it understands that we are united and that our dispositional complex, however individual and diverse, is always directed to a goal, be it the true hope of the gospel or the deceptive promise of the idol. And the reason why I and other people have been talking a lot about idolatry over the last few years, remember, idolatry is always supremely against God first, then it has horizontal consequences, but against you and you alone, one of the great Puritan texts, idolatry is always against God. But the reason why idolatry is such a, um, an important theological concept is because it's not just about us being like brains on sticks. There's an affective element to it all. There's, it, it, it's a heart reason, which is not uh, um, less than intellectual, but includes all the faculties. And that's why I would think leading with a rationalistic apologetic, especially in our culture, sometimes has mixed success. Because you can give the best reasons for belief, and people are just thinking, well, you know, the, what's, you know, it hasn't touched them. It hasn't touched their emotions or their will or their imagination. Idolatry covers all of those things, as we see in those great passages in uh, Isaiah, where the heart is really a, is the heart is the centre. And so, any apologetic that we do has to be intellectual and emotional and volitional and imaginative. And I think part of the problem we have at the moment is that I still think we're leading with quite a rationalistic apologetic in a culture that's kind of just going in a, doesn't respond. Now, of course, again, you know, I believe in reason from a Christian presupposition, as it were. But that idea of kind of holistic, and again, then understanding sin like that, I mean, I'm sure it's teeing up James for what he's, he's, he's going to say tomorrow. But, you know, sin is not only, how, how would I put it? Sin is not only bad, 
Sin is sad and sin is mad. There's a madness, there's an irrationality to sin that sometimes if you're a kind of a, a rational apologist, you think, well, look, what more can I do? You're going to go, you're going to go nuts because you think, surely this is so clear. The deceitfulness of the heart to kind of twist all kinds of things. Doesn't mean we shouldn't we continue which apologetic best glorifies God. Now, how do we kind of understand all of this in a yeah, this knowing and not knowing. And here again, I think J.H. Bavink comes to the rescue in his book, Religious Consciousness. He has a great illustration. I think you know, it's limited. It doesn't work all the time. But he says, look, think about this idea of knowing, not knowing. It's a bit like dreaming. He says, when you have a dream or you have a nightmare, things that have happened during the day suddenly take on twisted and distorted significance. So he has the idea of, um, I think the illustration he has is that the... Um, the dripping of water into an eaves trough in the dream becomes the monotonous uh, ticking of a clock or a train that you experienced when you went out for a walk now becomes a monstrous uh, army of soldiers at night marching towards you. And Bavink says the suppression of truth is like that. We take something in reality And we suppress it and distort it and take it out of shape. And it becomes the fulcrum for all kinds of fantasies. And that's how sin works. There's that distortion. There's that suppression. It's taking that good thing, the the real thing, and distorting it and twisting it. And of course, the Bible has great ways to describe that. There's a sense in which uh, people are in that fantasy world. They are uh, walking the walking dead in a living nightmare. And our job, our task, is to kind of wake them up from that in all kinds of ways. You know, when I have a nightmare and I wake up, my wife says to me, it's, it's not real. How, how do we bring reality to these, this madness, I suppose? And we have to do it um, truthfully, We have to do it with gentleness and respect, but we have to do it in a way that is persuasive. The problem is, and I've noted, if Oak Hill students here will know this, I've said this so many many times, is that the fact is that there is not, people, people aren't thinking about these things. People out there today in Ealing or London or wherever you are, they're just living their lives. They're not doing a kind of conscious a non-Christian version of Catalyst. They're just living. And so what we have to do is to help them. And Isaiah 44 gets this really well. Remember Isaiah 44, that great passage where the idolater, um, it's like, you know, the satirical passage where um, the the idolater makes their uh, dinner, tea, supper, however you want to. I still call it tea in the evening, but, you know... um, uh, makes their dinner, and then with the, the fuel, they then make an idol out of it. And Isaiah's kind of saying, this is absolutely ridiculous. But Isaiah 44, 19, no one stops to think. People aren't thinking about this stuff. They're just kind of going on with their lives. And our job, one of our jobs is to make them stop and think. Do, do you know what you're doing there? Just like God's people in, uh, in, in Jeremiah. Do you know you're drinking from a crack cistern when there's a fount of living water here? This is craziness. Why, why would you do that? But how do we make the connections between crack cistern and living water? That's the problem that we've got. We don't, we're struggling to think, how do we get traction to make, link one to the other? Now, that's the Romans 1 kind of anthropology. We know and we don't know at the same time. Now, we see that supremely, I suppose, as in, in an exemplary fashion in the other war horse, which I make no excuse for just having a little look at in this first session, Act 17. Now, I've read more theses and commentaries on Act 17 than I could shake a stick at, but uh, I, I think there are some key points that are um, crucial here. And I start with a little, um, uh, I'm going to call it polemical self-justification. A few years ago, um, Peter Bolt, who um, was a, is a New Testament scholar, 
was at Moore College now, I think he's at Sydney University, wrote an article called Evangelism, the Simplicity of Changing the World, where he said this, Once upon a time in a land far away, I heard a speaker at a conference insisting that evangelism ought to engage with the cultures around us. The task seemed so complicated, mapping conceptual worlds, integrating lofty ideas into unseen mental frameworks, and all of this was to be done well before you open your mouth about Jesus. Everyone I spoke with at morning tea had been thoroughly convinced of one thing. They could never do the kind of thing the speaker was calling for. And most of them were ministers who had gone through a full theological education. What hope would the unlettered and ordinary amongst us have, as the apostles were called in Acts 4.13? Now, I'm 99% certain that was about an address that I gave at the Evangelical Ministry Assembly a few years ago. 99% which was an exposition of Acts 17. I just leave that with you <laughs> as I come to this little section here. Paul is not even meant to be in Athens, really, but he's on a kind of a stopover, waiting for his friends. And uh, the, uh, 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 Athens is described, in, in the only time it, uh, a city is described as literally submerged in idolatry. But what Paul doesn't say is, stuff it, leave them to it, I'm just going to wander off and wait for my friends and go on. He does what he always does, he engages. And uh, interestingly, he is talking about Jesus and the resurrection. He's proclaiming Jesus and the resurrection. He's not doing a massive apologetic and then getting to Jesus. He's been talking about Jesus and the resurrection. The problem is they do not understand a word he is talking about. You are a babbler. Literally, you are a seed picker. You're picking ideas that you, we do not understand. So they haul him in front of the, uh, the Areopagus. And the word, I suppose, just one word that I want to focus on this time, lots of things to say about this uh, particular uh, narrative, is what Paul says. Paul then stood up, verse 22, at the meeting of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. Now, I've read just recently uh, a PhD thesis just on Acts 17, and there's a whole chapter devoted to what Paul means by that word, religious. Uh, Deus Diamonesteros. And it's a very complicated thing to work out because it only appears in this form ever. It's a hapax. It's just one, once only. But I think is a way of summing up this idea that human beings both know and don't know God. That human beings, as said this morning, as said, was said this morning, are both running to God and running away from God at the same time. This word beautifully encapsulates that human anthropology that we've been talking about in Romans 1. One person who kind of nailed this was the late Greg Barnson in his apologetics book, Always Ready. He says this about this word, religious. It's not beyond possibility that Paul cleverly chose this term precisely for the sake of its ambiguity. His readers would wonder whether the good or bad, bad sense was being stressed by Paul. That is to say, you could interpret this word religious as Paul sneering at them. Ha, you've got this unknown God, you fools. Or it could be the good sense. Wow, you've got this unknown God. And now you're kind of on the right track, and now I'm going to pro proclaim Jesus to you. So there's different ways you can read it, and it's fascinating, I think, depending upon your theological anthropology, how you interpret that word in Acts 17 here. Anyway, back to Bunsen. His readers would wonder whether the good sense, let's call that the handshake to the Athenians, or the bad sense, let's call that the rugby scrum, he's ready for a fight, was being stressed by Paul, and Paul would be striking a double blow. People cannot eradicate a religious impulse within themselves, as the Athenians also demonstrate. And yet this good impulse has been degraded by rebellion against the living and true God, as the Athenians also demonstrate. Although people do not acknowledge it, 
they are aware of their relation and accountability, Romans 1, to the living and true God who created them, but rather than come to terms with him and his wrath against their sin, they pervert the truth. And in this, they become ignorant and foolish. I think the word is being used in an intentionally ambiguous way. Or maybe ambiguous isn't the right word. The word I'll use um, on Thursday is plurivalent. Two meanings being used at the same time that don't completely clash with each other. This is... the. The, the, on, the, on the one hand, these are people who know. And that's why Paul has to start somewhere. And he says, look, you already worship all these different beings, but you're hedging your bets. You've got this unknown God. But it can't be a handshake. It can't be him affirming them in that because he's already nearly been ill because of idolatry. You know, the, uh, the deep, Paul was deeply distressed by the idolatry. The deep distress is that of a paroxysm. It's not a kind of, oh, disappointing it's a deep kind of, you know, Deuteronomy 32 kind of God being provoked at the idolatry. It's that word that's used. And so it can't be. The discursive framing of Acts 17 is Paul is nearly sick because of idolatry and at the end he calls people to repent. He can't then be saying, isn't it great you've got an unknown God? The tone is, is somber. But on the other hand, Therefore, he says, you're, you're ignorant. And it's not as if I'm going to now, there's a gradual stepping stone. You're halfway there, Athenians, and now we're going to get to Jesus. No, there's going to have to be a turning around of all kinds of different ways of understanding the world. And yet he has to start somewhere. There is that religious impulse. There is the pilot light that's on. I mean, and it's obvious what the kind of implications are for us. And we're going to talk more about this on Thursday. But as we wander around the objects of worship in our society, as we pass that poster about Ubuntu, or as we look at the HSBC thing, how do we understand those things? How do we kind of exegete them and theologically engage with them in a way that would connect Christ to these cultural artifacts that, that talk about the deepest longings and desires of our society at the moment? And if you don't think there are any, then... I don't know what world you're in. Because the world is crying out, has so many desires and longings for all kinds of things. Yes, they're massively disordered. Yes, they need to be both subverted and fulfilled in Christ. But we need the eyes to see those things. And there won't be, I would argue, maybe in the traditional religious categories that we've thought that they have been. So, Paul's approach is a, is a religious reaching out to people um, if we continued, we, we, we could look at the sermon or the, the summary of the sermon from verse 24. Again, you can, really, you've got the kind of the, the seeds of a full, not a full, you've got the seeds of a systematic theology here in terms of Paul saying, from now on, when I say God, I talk, I mean a God who is both transcendent and imminent. Not one or the other. He does not. Uh, dwell in temples uh, um, as if he needed anything because he gives all life to men. It's not a cyclical understanding of history. It's a linear view. All these different theological things that he has to kind of um, say from now on, this is what I mean. And this is one of the reasons why I think, in our context at the moment, if you just talk about Jesus and the resurrection without that context, then people don't know what you're talking about. I really, I really do believe that. I mean, the, 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 the ironies are well, tragic. On the one hand, still, in our unwritten constitution, at the coronation service, the queen is given a Bible. This is the most valuable thing this world affords. This is the rule of princes. These are the lively oracles of God. We still watch it. We still go to YouTube, watch that ceremony. I think the moderator of the Church of Scotland gives the Bible to the Archbishop of Cantu, gives it to the queen. Certainly, the, the, the moderator of the Church of Scotland is, is involved in some capacity. Um, you know, that's there, the most valuable thing that this world, world affords. And yet, contrast that with, on the anniversary of the King James Bible a few years ago, the professor um, at Leicester University who was curating that particular exhibition said, um, well, I think it was Boyd Tonkin in The Independent, the journalist, said, this professor had said that he'd been 
doing a postgrad seminar where when the name Moses came up, no one had any idea who that was. Apart from the Muslim student who says, oh, it sounds a bit like Musa. So you've got an unwritten constitution which says the Bible is the most precious thing this world affords. And you've got very you know, basic biblical characters that people don't know about. Now, I would argue in that particular context, let alone adding in what 2,000 years of Christian history means and all, that, all those complexities... That I think what Paul does here is he has to give a run-up and a run-through. He has to say, I want to proclaim to you Jesus and the resurrection, but there's a worldview, there's a context into which this has to make sense. Or else people will just think, you're babblers, you're seed pickers. More about that tomorrow and Thursday. And of course, at the end, Paul's appeal is the call to repentance should never forget that. It is a call to repent. Again, fascinating, really interesting. How many of us would say the purpose of the resurrection here is proof that Jesus is coming to judge? <laughs> That's what, you know, the resurrection, if people have heard about it at all, of course it's about new life. But here it's proof that Jesus is going to judge the world. And so this, I, this appeal is the call to turn around, to turn from those crack systems to turn to the fount of living water now this is all by way of uh, introduction so we have this idea that human beings are running to and running away from God at the same time that we know and we don't know at the same time and even the greatest apologetic minds um, I'm very influenced by this guy, Cornelius Van Til, but there are others as well. They say when it comes to this knowing and not knowing, it's very difficult how to articulate it. But, it, but it's true. And you, don't you see now, when we take that reformed richness of theological anthropology, no wonder there's a kind of this Taylor Stark thing kind of makes sense. There's a way in which we have become disenchanted, but there's a way in which we've, we are always enchanted. In fact, we might think, well, disenchantment, that makes it much more uh, difficult for the gospel. But actually, it is complex because there's a way in which, I would argue, the Reformation brought a great disenchantment, which was really good because people weren't believing in superstitious things that they were before. That's one of the great things about Cranmer, I think. It was getting away with some of that enchantment that was very unhelpful. So it's a very mixed picture. But I think you could start to make more sense of it through these biblical lenses of saying, yeah, just people know and they don't know. They're running to God and running away from God. And how do we then deal with that? And what we're going to look at tomorrow is a particular framework, these magnetic points that will start to unpack that, these five magnetic points that J.H. Bavink talks about that all human beings are engaged with or questions that they're answering all the time that are part of what it means to be human. Now, we might have some time for questions, but I conclude with this. We've been talking about this cosmic game of hide-and-seek, remember? We think God's hiding, but God's not hiding. He's revealed himself. We are hiding. We are the ones who are hiding. God is not hiding in fact, God, in that, I don't mean this in a facetious way, God's not a great hider. Have you ever played hide-and-seek with a three-year-old? Terrible at hide-and-seek. You explain the rules to them. You say the idea is that you've got to go and hide. You walk into the room where they're hiding, and they can't contain themselves. They burst out, here I am. No, the game is hide-and-seek. Go and hide. I will come and find you. You go into the room again. They burst out again. We know, don't we, in the Lord Jesus Christ, God is jumping up and down. Here I am. Here I am. God is not hiding. We are hiding. God is not hiding, but he is the best seeker. When I was three or four, I played hide and seek with my mum and dad. And uh, I found a great place to hide right at the back of the sofa. And I couldn't understand why... Five minutes, they were laughing, my parents, and then after 50 minutes, they were crying. Didn't I know what was going on? At that point, I knew they were angry, so I was not going to come out for anyone. (laughs) 
And then I don't know what happened. My dad must have had another look under the sofa because he looked under and must have seen a kind of a bit of stray sock. And he reached in and he pulled me out. The Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. I want to encourage you. We may think that we're hitting our heads against a brick wall in engaging the culture, but anthropologically, that is impossible. There is always a point of contact. There is always a way to confront and connect. There's always a way in every age and in every culture. We have to do our homework. We have to wander around objects of worship. We have to do that work. But there's a way, there's always a way to introduce people to Christ. And I personally think that these magnetic points that we're going to be talking about tomorrow are a really helpful tool for our particular moment.